Welcome to Liberty Law Talk. This podcast is a production of the online journal Law and Liberty and hosted by our staff. Please visit us at lawliberty.org and thank you for listening. Welcome to Liberty Law Talk. My name is Brian Smith and I am the editor of Law and Liberty. With me today is Spencer Clavin, a prominent podcaster who has a new show with uh, Daily Wire Plus forthcoming, classicist, uh, magazine editor for the Claremont Review of Books, and the author of the new book, How to Save the West, Ancient Wisdom for Five Modern Crises. And I'm very glad to have Spencer on the show. It's a delight to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. So I have a confession to make, which is Mm. that when I first saw the title of the book, I thought to myself, not another defense of the canon. This this just (laughs) cannot work. (laughs) But read the book refreshingly. And and I, you know, as I got to know you at a conference uh, recently, I realized that can't be the book. It won't be the book. Uh, And you say so right away in it. But what I think, just so we take anyone who has this uh, apprehension and, and sort of diffuse this so that they go and buy your book. I want you to talk about what led you to write it and what makes you, you and this book different from the rest of the defending the Western canon genre that we've seen so many entries in recently. Yeah. I really appreciate your asking that question actually, because I too, um, it's sort of like that poem. I too dislike it. I too dislike poetry. <laughs> I too dislike defenses of the canon or rather I'm, I'm sort of, you know, bored with them. And I do say up front in the book that this is is not a defense of the canon full stop. The other thing I say it's not is it's not a survey. Uh, it's not the five books you need to read to get a grasp on the whole of Western literature. It's not a reading list. There are other good books that deal more comprehensively and at greater length with that sort of issue. I mentioned a couple, you know, Jacques Barzan, mm-hmm. yeah. Harold Bloom. Go, go read those guys if, if that's what you want. What I would say, this this book isn't a survey, it's not a defense, it's an offering. And that comes out of the podcast Young Heretics, which was sort of the first, my first foray into podcasting. And, and I kind of began that podcast because it occurred to me that on the right, in the conservative movement, even among kind of, you know, well-intentioned liberals who believe in the value of the Western canon, Uh, We do a lot of fighting in and speaking in defense of the Western canon. We ought to be teaching Homer. We shouldn't be scrubbing them from the curriculum. They're not all just dead white men. Here's the relevance and so forth. And something that I noticed is we spend so much time defending our right to read Homer that we don't spend all that much time actually reading Homer. I mean, it occurred to me, you know, the, the... number of people who pound their fists on the table and say, you know, oh, the greats of the West, like uh, we've got to, we've got to keep them in schools. I sometimes wonder whether those, those people are cracking the spines themselves. And the the point of, right. I mean, the point of preserving (laughs) this stuff is for it to change you, to shape you. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, even if it isn't erased from the internet, even if it isn't taken out of the school curriculums, none of that will matter if you personally, wherever you're at, in your family, in your home, in your community, aren't exposing your soul to the forming influence of these great works. I think that's what they're for. I think that's why they endure. They don't endure because they're complicated or fancy or elevated. They don't endure uh, because they furnish material for PhD theses. They endure because somewhere in them, right, is wisdom about how to be good at being human. And the reason the subtitle of the book is, you know, Ancient Wisdom for Five Modern Crises is I think that the moment we're in, especially the moment that has been kind of accelerated by digital technology, as I discuss a lot in the book, is dredging up and presenting us with a lot of fundamental questions about uh, what what it is to be a human being and just what is this universe in which we live. And there's an irony, as I say in the introduction, that, you know, these, the great works of the canon, the the intellectual inheritance of Athens and Jerusalem um, is being most maligned precisely when it's most needed. This is what these resources exist for. That's what And by people who should know better. Oh. By people who should know the best. (laughs) 
In fact, I think in, in some cases by people who know exactly what they're doing, because of course, depriving people of the resources to take a certain degree of ownership over their own spiritual, psychological, political formation is a really good way to present yourself as the savior of the world, right? Absolutely. And so the reason it's a how-to, you know, despite the kind of uh, ostensible grandeur of that title, the, the ambitions of the book are actually much smaller than you might expect upon cracking the spine. They're not, you know, people who open this book expecting some political program to quote unquote, fix all problems, capital F, capital P, right? <laughs> uh, those people are going to be disappointed because what you're going to be finding instead, right, is is a selection, an offering, as I said, of, of ways of thinking about these fundamental questions. Who are we? Uh, what are we made out of? Where are we going? That are uh, time-tested, rich, and for you. And that's that's what I'm offering here. And so one thing that really strikes me in what you just said is Maybe giving it to you as an anecdote. So in graduate school, I feel like anytime you're in graduate school for great books, like both of us were, um, Mm -hmm. I did political theory, you did classics. Right. There's a sense in which you're surrounded by technicians often. Mm. Now, I I was very fortunate in that I had professors that were not technicians, Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Deneen, Josh Mitchell, uh, others. But there's very much a sense of as you professionalize, you're going to read these books to understand the discourse around these books and what falls out of that kind of training and education, I think quite often is the very thing you're pointing us toward, which is how do these books form our souls? How do these books offer that guide to life? How, how, how might they simply show us, don't go down that door. That's the Nichean door, bad door, <laughs> uh, or, or, or things like that. So is there a sense in which any of your graduate school experience or, you know, your exposure to the academy before you ran screaming in, informs this book? Yeah. I mean, I, you don't explicitly say this, but I, I had the suspicion that like some of this has to do with a reaction to how academia does things. Yeah, that's that's well put. You know, I'm like you in that I had a lucky grad school experience I had. And I always feel really like responsible to say this when I launch my critique of the academy, which is severe and structural, because I do believe that in America, especially, but in, you know, Europe as well, the academy is suffering a a real kind of identity crisis and in some ways a kind of self an implosion, self-destruction. And so I always feel like I need to put the caveat on there that I also, I too had wonderful instructors who didn't view these texts as kind of, uh, objects of power to wield or, you know, kind of a certain kind of brand mystique that they could attach to their own person, like all these ways that that you see people misusing, I think, the great works. But that that matter of technicity that you identified is so important. And one reason why I did not end up pursuing a career in academia is I, I feared that the technicity would become the point. For people like you and me, who spend their devote their lives to the life of the mind, the pleasure of that technical expertise is very great. And indeed, the temptation to pride in it is also very great. It becomes very easy to forget, especially if you seal yourself off hermetically in a world of technicians, that all techne, all uh, you know, forms of all kind of practices of uh, doing something well and with craft. Are, are in service of something. They're, they're handmaidens. They're not goals. And one thing that immediately became clear to me as I started the podcast and as I, you know, also as I wrote this book is, you know, I get a lot of people who come up to me and say, oh, you're really smart. I'm not that smart, you know. Mm-hmm. And by that, they didn't actually mean what they were saying. What they meant is you've got all these tools in your tool belt. And that's, and that's actually true. Like, I don't want to deny that it takes some doing to kind of unpack a paragraph of, of Aristotle. Um, but if, but if you're doing that and if you're devoting your, your life and investing, you know, the, the kind of human capital that you've been given by God as a, as a person, then you ought to be doing it for someone and for something. And that's, yes, that's what I think is, is lost in our approach to these books a lot of the time. And in some ways it's a way of neutralizing them and, uh, and diffusing them because what they have to say is so explosive. Um, and in some ways so contradictory to kind of the going conventional wisdom 
of uh, just our modern gurus, um, that if we can look at them as Aristotle, if we look at Aristotle as, you know, simply a kind of uh, animal in a jar or a bacteria in a Petri dish that we can isolate and study, um, then we never have to risk exposure to his claim, for instance, that man is a political animal, right? Like that, imagine if like you actually had to consider that as a truth claim that could or could not be be true of you, you know, what would that do? Well, it's, it's, it, it becomes news in yeah. the Kierkegaard sense. Like, you know, you, uh, totally. <laughs> the, the, these are not just sort of scientific claims. The news has arrived and you've got to decide how to live with it. Right. I've nursed. So sometime in graduate school, I remember stumbling on this statistic. It was reported in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. that something north of 60 or 70%, depending on the field of graduate students in the humanities and social sciences would suffer severe depression <sighs> during the course of their studies. Jeez. Yeah. And, and. And at, at a certain point, you know, when just in a PhD program in politics, I started to notice that my colleagues were sort of divided selves fairly often. They wanted to apply these theories uh, in a very technical way to other people, and yet it couldn't it, it couldn't help but infiltrate their life. Yeah. So I, I, I'm reminded of this uh, passage in uh, one of Jay Buduszewski's books where he says. You know, I set out to prove all morality was essentially arbitrary Mm -hmm. and that our choices were equally arbitrary and that all of our emotional states were equally meaningless. Mm -hmm. And yet I loved my wife and I loved my children, but this theory couldn't help but bleed back in to the way in which I treated my wife and my children. Mm. He said that was the moment that act the despair from that was actually the moment that he turned right, and went in search of something that was better, that he could actually wager his life on. Two passages come to mind. One that you and I just recently shared when we were at that conference on yeah. Brothers K, you know, Dostoevsky in that, that novel has a wonderful moment between Alyosha, the kind of hero, and not his... Uh, you know, beloved mentor, Father Zosima, but actually a more severe kind of almost administrator in the monastery, mm-hmm. Father Paisi, who he thinks doesn't really like him very much, but he pulls him aside, right? And he says, you know, men think that by isolating uh, the technicity of the world, the, the, the science of the world, they've um, reduced uh, object, objective truth about uh, morality, they've reduced virtue to mere fantasy, Um, But the people bear witness to the impossibility of that view and their own hearts bear witness also. I mean, I think this is something very much in evidence and really important, especially in an era where one's convictions, one's gut reactions to things, one's subjective, quote unquote, experiences of things are written off as totally without worth or or merit yeah. you know you take the true claim which is that your first impressions of something need uh you know they might need revision they might need you to kind of step back and consider them and understand them and we've advanced that to the claim that actually your your loves your aspirations your virtue your attachments these are uh, illusions they're after effects they're byproducts of what's mm-hmm. quote unquote really going on which is matter bouncing off of matter essentially and it since it's impossible to live that way you do end up in a situation where your own life kind of bears witness against your philosophy which is a profoundly neurotic place to be exactly and you said two passages oh you're right i'm sorry i got so wrapped up in the dostoevsky the other one in c.s lewis the uh that hideous strength which is the conclusion of his space trilogy. By far, my favorite fiction that Lewis ever wrote. I know people know Narnia and love Narnia, but that third installment of of the space trilogy for me is uh, his masterwork. And it pertains, it's basically an artistic enactment of the abolition of man. It deals with a lot of these questions of scientism and and, uh, materialism. But there's a moment at the end, like very small spoiler alert, that one of the guys whose whole project has been to reduce human life to determinism. It's all kind of neurons firing in the brain and fate just kind of carries us where it will because we're a, we're a machine. He finds himself overtaken at the last moment, like uh, one of the 
uh, one of the denizens of a fairy tale city who's turned to stone by a curse um, that actually was all real all along. You know that the things yeah. that the, the, the things he was uh, playing with in his kind of neat syllogisms were were deadly serious. I think that's a situation we find ourselves in a lot as well. Yes. No. I think those are those are very apt quotes for for this problem. And your book is filled with many others. But I want to drag us back to that because we could talk about other stuff like this all day long. Let's talk Um, about the book. So you list five crises. And given that you sort of start and end the book by circling around this, I wanted to to focus on what I take to be the most foundational one, which is over our sense of reality. Mm -hmm. What is this crisis? Why do you think it matters? Yeah, you know, I begin, one thing I, I do in the book throughout is you sort of start with a news cycle moment that everybody's familiar with or remembers from the last couple of years. And then you kind of, I, I've, 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 I kind of unravel that into, well, here's 10 other news cycle moments you probably forgot about from the last 20 years that all kind of point in this direction. And here, in fact, is this long history of dealing with this part- this very problem. And the one that the book starts off with is, is the metaverse, is virtual reality, essentially, and immersion into virtual reality. And this way that a lot of our elites have of talking as if the distinction between my actual daily experience of life, uh, which I would think of as like, you know, reality and a computer generated simulation that stimulates the brain in such and such a way, that distinction is really quaint and kind of outmoded and superstitious, right? And so it's not, you know, it's really not to get down on Mark Zuckerberg or on Meta or, the, you know, whatever, Facebook and so forth. It's, it's rather to use these statements and these product launches as ways of uncovering a real philosophical conviction, which we can, once you see it, it's like putting on the, uh, you know, the green glasses, you see the Emerald City, you can see it, mm-hmm. you can see this everywhere. And I think that this speaks to a real, a, a conviction that, that some things are very, very true, right? We, we have uh, still in our society, because it's impossible to live any other way a desire to lay claim to reality and to truth and also a total lack of grounding of where, you know, where do we root that is, is reality the uh, things that the images that my neurons cough up on the screen of my eyes. Um, And in in which case the metaverse is just fine as a substitute for reality. It's not even a substitute. It's just an equivalent alternative that I happen to find more pleasurable. Uh, or is reality some other thing? And if it's some other thing, is it, you know, the idea of the good? Is it uh, my, my physical experience of the world, right? B- without, before even asking the questions, I mean, the first section of the book, I don't even begin to ask the question, well, you know, is reality abstract truth or is it, uh, mm-hmm. you know, emotional truth or whatever? Get into that much later. As you say, this, this question is threaded throughout the whole book. But really the first question and the fundamental question with which uh, Western philosophy proper begins is, do you believe that somewhere in some realm of experience, there are things that are true, uh, no matter who says so, or who says otherwise, um, things that you can't change just by feeling differently about them, um, things that you can't wish or imagine into existence and that you will never be free of, even if you blind themselves to them, right? You know, you take Plato's cave, which is kind of, I say in the book, it's the original metaverse, you know, the idea right. that you're already in some, in some sense being blinded by, you know, the, the sort of sophists that run your culture and by your own presuppositions. The point of that story is our third person view. The reason it's a revealing story is because it draws back the camera. So we're looking from the outside, right, into the cave. And we're able to see that even though for the people shackled to the walls of Plato's cave, there is no reality other than this. There is, in fact, an an external, truer uh, reality outside of that kind of fantasy. And that matters even for the people who believe in the fantasy. Just as we were talking about Mm -hmm. earlier, you know, if you invent a world where your emotions are are fictive uh, and where your moral convictions are arbitrary, you can construct that world in speech all you want, but the reality of of actual moral truths is going to come crashing down on you one way or another. And that's where we start to see the very tight and intimate connection between these kind of dismissals of absolute truth, of, of, of final reality, and uh, violence. Because if there is no absolute truth, you think you're kind yeah. of letting, being let free into some uh, glorious future where everything is whatever you want it to be and nothing is either good or bad and thinking makes it so. But of course, 
the only way then to determine what's going to happen is through an exertion of power through the, the Thrasymachus claim, you know, that, that, uh, yeah. the, the good of the, the, the power is, is basically the determiner of justice. Well, and I, and, and more, but, but even more darkly than that, I think there's mm. an element of, I can prove I'm really real by, by killing. Hmm. Right. Which becomes a theme in Russian, you know, Russian literature, like we've just read it, it becomes a reality and ideology in the 20th century. But, but there's also this other element, which you draw on throughout the book, which I, I, I think is very interesting. This, this idea that there's an explanation for why the dramas that we watch even have gotten so vacuous in our denial that there is a reality and consequence this multiverse theory where we can reinvent yeah. uh, characters' histories in, in a completely arbitrary way. And we can take m- what seemingly were meaningful moments, Thanos snapping his fingers, half of everybody dying, and just undo it in a heartbeat. And, and then th- nothing has any weight. How does this relate to Plato's cave? Say more about that, because I, 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 I want to hear that connection drawn a little bit more tightly. Yeah. So... This is where you do have to start to ask the question, well, okay, if you kind of intuitively feel that, in fact, there is such a thing as, as the real, and it's not you know, purely arbitrary or purely capable of being constructed at will, then where does it live, right? And I think the most readily available answer for most people to what is real is stuff, physical objects. They, they are <laughs> yeah. real, right? And there's an appeal to that answer, of course, because uh, as Aristotle observes, our sensory experience of physical things is the most vivid and immediate experience that we have. And it takes some doing. What is what is purest and realist uh, in, in actual fact is in some sense the last thing that we make our way toward if we ever get to right. contemplating, well, what is our, you know, okay, I see a brown table and a brown cow. What is brown, right? And a, as you reach those yes. levels of abstraction, Aristotle thinks, um, you also begin to uh, hone in on things that are kind of more have more integrity as uh, entities than uh, just like you know the the physical objects you see in front of you, and yet crucially, right? Reality only ever comes to us mediated through our senses. So it's very easy to make this mistake that well, just there's only matter, right? Matter is is what is real, mm-hmm. and basically, my argument about the multiverse is that <laughs> as an artistic failure, it is kind of the final breakdown of of materialism as a philosophy. And I think, you know, everybody's looking for the grand uh, victory that's going to stop uh, people from thinking that the, the world is just atoms, you're going to be able to, to prove such and such a thing. And one thing I argue a lot in the book is that these aren't the kinds of questions that subject themselves to scientific proof. And since, you know, if, right. if you believe that that matter and, and scientific questions are the only things that exist, um, you're going to trap yourself in a little tightly sealed box with no opening because there then will be no mode of accepting any kind of truth that is other than the one that you've already determined for yourself. And I think the emptiness of our art, uh, as it becomes more and more inspired by a kind of neo-Epicurean philosophy of of pure matter, of of atoms bouncing off one another, is itself not uh, proof, but evidence, an indication that science is basically trying to lift itself up by its own bootstraps. And that's, you know, Plato's claim is that the effort to extract truth from your day-to-day experiences is already a difficult enough task, right? Is already something that requires long years of study and effort and perhaps even divine intervention. And the, the multiverse claim is essentially that no, in fact, the things that you know you can see and touch are basically the realest possible thing that you know they're the only thing really that we can count as real at all and other than that it's basically just shadows on the wall it's just fantasies right it's just right. throwing these up. and that's why those i mean those fantasies are empty if, if in fact you you believe that that's what you're doing when you're telling stories you're just pressing certain buttons in the brain you're just uh you know confecting certain shadows on the wall then you know you're you are going to end up with stories that don't mean anything because they don't refer to anything outside of themselves right and I, I do also wonder whether there isn't an implicit link here between the people who find these stories compelling or this and the people who, having embraced the idea that matter is everything, begin to doubt their own loves, mm. their their own 
their own affections toward people, places, things, mm-hmm. institutions. Right. And so this, the, this is a society for whom all the solid things melt into air. And, it, and yet, I also think that there's some hope in the sense that the shows and the forms of art that rebel against this, that say reality is not just the evidence of your senses. It doesn't try to, the ones that don't try to beat you over the head with this fact seem to be the most successful ones. I think of a show like Yellowstone, for instance, yeah. is this is, this is a show about very intense affections yeah, right, and deep hist historical sort of ties that people are not willing to break and it asserts something real beyond the senses. You know, uh, another show that comes to my mind is uh, White Lotus. And there's oh, yeah. a, you know, this, this comedy, uh, dark comedy about, it's really about uh, sexual relations and power relations in an era of woke mores and what i love about this show although it's kind of viewer discretion advised you know um, yeah. <laughs> like in a big way uh, w- what i love about it is that rather than perform a little morality play where all the people with the wrong ideas get theirs the show creators have simply depicted the problems and consequences of woke sexual ethics as in fact they are and there's no like you know, grand scene of repentance where somebody makes a big speech about this is my philosophy. But there is a a, a sense that ideas have consequences, philosophies have consequences. And if we're going to show these things on screen, to be fully honest about them, we can't just depict the fact of their existence. I mean, this is something that I think both conservatives and and liberals get wrong about the culture wars, which I talk about also in in the book. You know, (laughs) we, we think of this as some sort of debate about, you know, is art going to just show anything goes? Uh, Are we just going to be totally free to, you know, put anything on screen? Or are we going to side with those nasty conservatives who don't want you to be able to show certain things, want the Hayes code back and, and so forth? And what we don't realize, I think, is there's no such thing as as art that is anything goes. Art inherently contains a moral outlook on the world because the reality of 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 moral truth is actually inescapable. We don't, it's impossible for us to think without it. The very forms, the shape of our mind. We need rules. We need rules. Uh, I mean, yes. I mean, it reminds me of an essay you once wrote for us on video games, but you know, yeah, it was, that's right. Yeah. Rules and, uh, and the good, right. We need, we need ideals. Um, we need, uh, objectives. You need the telos. And so really what we're in is a fight over whose rules, whose vision of reality is going to be publicly honored um, and awarded, uh, and, and, you know, and more regularly produced in these, you know, big, big movie houses. And the, the ones that are, you know, most on offer are kind of, uh, Epicurean nihilism. There's million universes, nothing you do matters, except that, you know, we'd be kind of peaceful and pleasurable, uh, amongst ourselves. And then, you know, there is this new strain, you're right, of, of art that is not, uh, preachy. It's not like a conservative tractate. And in fact, many of the people that are making it are not traditionally speaking conservatives, yeah. but that, that simply recognizes the total inadequacy. I mean, look, I just went to see Avatar way of way of water uh, part two, this time it's wet. And like, uh, this is, you know, here's like <laughs> James Cameron, a guy who's made movies that I really like. I think Terminator one is one of the great movies, a great, you know, pop art of, of, uh, the last few decades. But, uh, this guy spent 10 years on uh, basically a roller coaster ride. And, and what has he got to say? I mean, there's just this, this kind of like wonder of, of science, Earth Mother Gaia. It's all energy bouncing off of Adam's man. It, it, it is so played out and that even when it makes money uh, at the box office, people kind of know they're being served thin gruel. Um, and that's yeah. kind of the hope I think you're talking about. It's like, you know, it, 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 we are still in a situation economically where, where people feel incentivized to like slap another cut of kind of raw meat on the table for, for the lumpen proletariat to consume. And yet everybody knows this stuff is, is inadequate. That, that in fact, shows like White Lotus, shows like Yellowstone, you know, shows that kind of put the moral universe out in front of your eyes as if it had urgent reality are kind of becoming more 
uh, more, more popular for exactly this reason. They feed the soul better. Right. So I want to shift gears a little bit yeah. uh, and, and talk about one of your best phrases. I, I mean, the book has a lot of great phrases right. and, and, and sort of pithy encapsulations of really complex thoughts. Uh, my favorite, the aptest, I think, is something you call soul dysphoria. Mm. I and mean, in that section, you explain a bunch of things, but you link body positivity, this whole movement, and the phenomena of sort of insta-photoshopping perfection. And, and, and you say that they have a common outlook. And I guess my question is, you know, so what's common to them? Why are they popular? What do they tell us about who we are right now? So near the beginning of that chapter, um, first of all, I'm really glad you noticed soul dysphoria because I thought, oh, it's just a subhead. But, you know, I, yeah, it, I think it's, it's, it's it was, I, I circled it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, well, okay. So let me, let me try to work into this, you know, near the beginning of that chapter, I say, you know, the, the kind of pop wisdom, pop psychology is that the soul is kind of extraneous, that it's kind of an appendage, that it's a holdover from certain kind of unclear evolutionary accidents that cause us to feel things like love and emotion, but really, you know, all, the, all we're really doing is just surviving physically. So given the fact that we have these bodies, why do we need to have thoughts and souls and consciousness at all? But in fact, since as we've been discussing now for at some length, right, um, in fact, since love and desire and the soul truths are realer in some sense and more urgently real than the kind of physical facts that, that follow upon them. The real question that everybody has always struggled with and that secretly we're still struggling with now is not why do I need a soul? It's why do I need a body, right? If I am this yeah. uh, being that is capable of making contact with abstract truths and with love and with all the high noble things that you and I have done, just been talking about and have, have talked a lot about off mic as well, then what's the point of this meat sack that's hanging off of my <laughs> divine spark, yeah. right? Like, yeah. um, and, and I think that is a very old, I mean, one of the things that that does, pulling back the camera on that does, is it helps have a little bit of, of charity and empathy for this for this problem. This is an old problem. It goes back, not necessarily, I don't think actually to, to Plato himself, um, but to some of Plato's interpreters uh, inside and outside the early Christian right. church, you know, um, Plotinus is somebody that I mention a lot in, in the book in this context. And if that's true, if the body is kind of an imposition or a fall or a descent, then it follows that the best thing we can do with it is just mold it uh, to our desires and to conform with our souls, our divine spark, our essence, our identity, whatever word you want to call that, um, to mold it as, as uh, directly to conform with our desires as possible. And that is the connection, which is a very you know central and old human impulse between the internet avatar the airbrushed yeah. Photoshop picture and the body positivity movement. They're all efforts to reconfigure the, the world of the body so that it matches people's uh, aspirations, the way they think they ought to be, uh, the thing that they think they somehow are secretly. And the great Christian and pagan truth, you know, the height of, of Athenian and Jerusalemite wisdom on this, on this topic is that you are not actually going to float away from your body into the true, the good, and the beautiful. You have a body because it is the medium in which the true, the good, and the right. beautiful is best expressed. Um, and, and that's the, like, the mind flip, I think, that the great texts can give us on this one. Well, and, and without, this, without this insight, I think it is relatively easy to yearn for a technological solution to the frailties or the dysmorphias that we have with our own form. Mm. I mean, this yearning for, which I think is expressed in science fiction, for uploading into, into a place where we can just define our own avatar. And it, on the one hand, it's kind of, any anyone who's played a role-playing game or played a, played a computer game where you create an avatar of some kind, I think can sympathize with this. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't I wish to be a thing I am not? I, I want to look uh, like my Lensa AI profile picture. Yeah. It looks better than I do in real life. It has, it doesn't have yeah. the aches and pains that I have. Yeah, totally. Right. right. And, 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 you know, and, and people who hit the gym, who lift weights, mm. you know, 
we're struggling against the limitations of our bodies with the weight we can't get rid of. And, and I mean, but, but in a way there's something I, I think which you, you get at that it's, it's more human to embrace the intersection of body and spirit mm. and, and live with those struggles and find things that give us traction for understanding that as in great books, mm-hmm. as in deep conversation with friends who share similar struggles without, without those touch points, it, it, it makes sense that some of the weirdness we're, we're inhabiting right now. I mean, I, I do kind of wonder in the world of no COVID ever happened, shutdowns never happened. Mm. Would the extreme antibody, tra- you know, sort of movements that we have right now have quite as much traction if people had not been cut off from one another, had been left in the face-to-face encounters that you you cannot avoid as a teenage person. And you think of you think of the who the the, the 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 biggest number of these people are. It's it's teenagers who have been most isolated, right? And found these online communities. Well, there is a moment in uh, the history of this problem, this question. Uh, in, in, in modernity that I found really striking. And that was a piece by Andrea Long Chu in the New York Times. This is a male to female transgender person making the argument that uh, bottom surgery wasn't, the point of bottom surgery wasn't happiness and that it wouldn't actually necessarily cure the depression or the discomfort because desire and happiness are unrelated agents, as is the line from the piece. And mm-hmm. to me, that is really at the heart of where this is actually going. Like that's at least a, a level of honesty about yeah. what actually happens if you disembody yourself or if you make your body into a plaything uh, to kind of respond to your whims is... <laughs> the terrible bind that we're in, it is a terrible, I mean, it's a fallen world, no question about it. But the, the problem is <laughs> if the, if the material world, including your own self is just kind of raw material to be dominated, mm-hmm. then you're not actually in a relationship with anything, including yourself. And you've in fact destroyed right. the possibility of relationship. So you will just be a bunch of diodes just kind of ha- beeping at, at will haphazardly in the end, right? That's yeah. basically what we are without bodies and our pushing up against something uh, physical, as you describe in the gym, which is a great example. Like there's a reason that, that people go to the gym now as like a kind of reaction against this trend it's it's yeah. precisely yeah because uh, making contact or dry, you know, having driven home to you that there is kind of a hard surface against which you're pushing up against lets you know you're not alone right like otherwise yeah. you're just it, it, it's it's lonely being a divine spark you know there's really nowhere right. to go with it well and and i you know what you just said makes me think this this entire movement that we're talking about it's the rejection of that augustinian understanding that we are intentional desiring creatures and by by sort of severing that understanding we're we're casting ourselves off we're we're adrift because if if you understand yourself as i am a sinful creature or maybe you don't even understand yourself as that to get this point if if, if you understand yourself as defined by the things you are attracted to and love mm. That at least opens the door to certain kinds of understanding through the body right. that the denial of that, the, the choose severing of desire and happiness, <laughs> yeah. once you make that leap, it, it becomes very hard to, it, it becomes very hard to reach this sort of person, even through art, I, I fear, in that. Historically, I, I feel like novels and poems and film and music can hit us where we don't expect it, not because they're attempting to crush our, our intellect, our, our, our intellectual defenses, but because they open us to a kind of experience in our hearts and in our longings that maybe we didn't see that way before. Wow. Yeah. That's very beautifully put. You know, Thank you. Um, something I uh, read after 
finishing the book that has been like a little mantra with me lately is this Simone Weil observation. Yeah. Um, and I'll probably butcher it because I've, I've repeated it. It's one of those things I've repeated in my head so many times that I feel like I probably have my own personal version of it that I don't want to like, you know, lay that on, on Vey. But I, I, she says something to the effect of, you know, love is a form of attention and attention is a form of prayer. And uh, somebody uh, that really affected me deeply this this year is Thomas Traherne, this uh, you know English mystic, kind of un- undiscovered for hundreds of years and then resurrected, you know, in the early twentieth century, I think, whose whole thing is about the, the beatific vision, right? And 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 the question for Ve and uh, and 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 Traherne both, I think, is you know, your actions imply a highest good. They imply a love, even if you don't. And and we have this kind of ridiculous, uh, cheapened idea about the word love, that it means butterflies in your stomach, that it means, you know, if you're not feeling those things, those are beautiful things, beautiful to, you know, have a crush on somebody. But, you know, if, if, if what you think is that you're not loving, if you're not experiencing those things, then you don't understand yourself, right? I mean, you're always, Beatrice says, to, to Dante, never creator nor creation was ever without love. And, and you know, the, everything that we do, every action that we perform by its inherent logic implies some uh, goal, some good, um, and pursuing that goal, paying attention to that goal, right? Devoting yourself, giving of yourself to it is love. And, and, and when you are mindlessly scrolling, uh, my, I'll, I'll pick my drug of choice, Twitter, it could be Instagram, whatever, you know, when you are lying, you know, in bed for the third straight hour that you, you know, hit snooze on your alarm, whatever, you're not not loving, you're not in a neutral space of like, I don't worship and people think they don't worship anything, they think whatever. Um, no, you're just you're just giving yourself over to another kind of worship, another kind of love that you have less control over and self awareness about. And really, you know, the, the, yeah, the, the reason that this body problem is so pernicious is because it holds out this, this fantasy that you can kind of choose, uh, the, the, the structure of your loves or have no loves at all. You can just be kind of a, a, a free floating entity that's not tied to or pulled toward anything. And that ain't going to happen. You know, we, 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 we exist in states of love at all times. Yeah, we we may not like those loves. No. We may not be quite aware of them, as you right. say, but they're really there. So I want to shift gears again. We've talked a bit about scientism already. You, you don't directly use that. I don't. I mean, I, I don't remember you using the phrase, the word scientism, anywhere in the book. Mm-hmm. But but there is this pervasive notion you talk about of science outstripping its proper boundaries in our imaginations. Quick quote from you: We call upon science now to explain not just how the physical word, world works, but how everything, italicized, everything <laughs> works and why, end quote. So I'd just like you to refer a bit on how you think this vision of science as a sort of ideology yeah. has added to the distortions we're experiencing and and these phenomena we've been talking about. Well, uh yeah, it's interesting. I've just I'm recording the audiobook now and I'm trying to remember if I've said the word scientism at all because it's a word that I use I all the time yeah. in like on the podcast and so forth. And I think it's a, a good insofar as it goes, I think it's a very good descriptor of what we're dealing with when when we talk about this sort of thing. But no, I didn't use it in this in this book because I wanted people step by step to really see what we're dealing with. You know, you, this is something, yeah. it's like one of those things where the, the two fish, the two young fish are swimming by and the old fish says, how's the water boys? And the young fish turns to his friend and says, what's water, right? I mean, this right. is what, what, what we're up against when we talk about something like scientism. It's so uh, pervasive. And really what it is, is the uh, swelling up of what the ancients would have called natural philosophy to swallow every other discipline branch of knowledge, way of, of doing things. And of course, natural philosophy is an ancient, good, and noble way of studying the world. It has to do with the things that behave according to physis, which is the Greek word for the things that happen spontaneously or according to fixed rules that are inherent in the things themselves. So it is in the nature of a stone, it is in the physis of a stone to fall to the ground when dropped because heavy objects objects with mass attract one another, right? They're, these are things that, mm-hmm. you know, even in describing them, you can freely and, and happily blend language from, you know, Aristotelian 
uh, metaphysics with kind of Newtonian mechanics and even on into quantum physics. This is a, a seamless tradition in that respect. Of course, there are many profound revolutions in, in science, but as a practice, as a human practice, it retains, I think, its noble character. What happens really to cause the neurosis that, that we're struggling with is the development of the idea that that form of knowledge, knowledge about spontaneous uh, rule-based behaviors in the natural world is the only form of knowledge. And this is where the reality thing becomes uh, important again, right? This is the only kind of truth. This is the only way that we can know things is through experiment and uh, verification. Uh, and, and therefore, the things that exist are, are physical things, and that's that, and there's nothing else to them. And I, I don't think I'm exaggerating when, you, when, I, when I say that even if this is not what people believe in their uh, you know, conscious minds, we all breathe this in like oxygen. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, all, we all know that. We all feel in our, in our bones that that, that that must be true. And one of the things I sort of try to show in the book is that it, it, that was never proven. That was not like a thing that, that happened uh, because somebody advanced some brilliant argument uh, that science is the only kind of, of truth. It's, it, it's actually something that, that happened as a, as a matter of circumstances. The church lost its claim on, on authority, and as truths began to come to light that science could reveal that, uh, th- that theological speculation couldn't, suddenly we, we became very addicted to this kind of, of knowledge because it's, it's powerful and it's reliable. You can always get it um, if you do it right, mm-hmm. and you can do things with it that uh, that make that make you very strong. And and this has now become our kind of our idolatry, our way of thinking about everything, the whole world. And it it is not strong enough to sustain that weight. This this thing where we now say you know trust the science, where uh, Dr. Fauci becomes like the de facto governor of. Uh, every state in America for two plus years, right? This is obviously a disordered way of living and of governing ourselves. And it arises directly out of this unsustainable effort to reduce all forms of truth to scientific truth, because some things don't have a scientific answer. Some very important things like moral questions, right? Okay. Yeah. The virus is this contagious. Should we therefore shut the country down? Right. Um, and, And what we're doing now is we're trying to find some way of rooting our answers to that question in science, right? As if we could empirically prove what the right answer is, um, because that's the only way that we think we, we can know anything. And really, in this respect, demoting science um, will be the best thing that, that ever happened to it out of, out right. of COVID. Well, because the only logic that science can lend itself to in terms of an ethical theory strikes me as something like a kind of crass utilitarianism, that that you're struck with, okay, so if our postulates are Health and and bodily integrity are the goods we're aiming mm-hmm. at, at least a, a sort of way of understanding of that. Then you can kind of understand how you get to these judgments of, like we're seeing again now, of oh yes, we need masks again because of the triple threat of viruses and the flu and 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 COVID version X. I I, I don't even know what we're at right now there. And so there is this oddity going on. You knew it was going to happen. Uh, there's there's a line from Walker Percy about this. Oh, here we go. Uh, Good. Yes. <laughs> here we okay. here we are. Right. You 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 <laughs> you, you had to expect uh, somebody it. Somebody should but, play a drinking but, game at home with this podcast. No, how many times? Exactly. <laughs> but he had this notion that what is happening with scientism is this ceding of our sovereignty to they, the experts, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that something is lost in that. When we, when we allow this notion that scientific expertise can claim sovereignty over the sorts of choices, the moral choices that define who we are. Yes. And that, that this, you know, that our, our, our insanity around this shows up in various ways Mm. that that people, people in their yearning to have that certainty, which we might find in the gospel. We might find it in the way we let our faith shape our lives. If you don't have that, it's really easy to sort of say, well, trust the science. The experts are telling us this is the right way to live. Yep. And so we just have to do as we're told. Yes, it's, it's very easy to find this argument made explicitly in the works of Wilsonian progressives, right? And, and that's... Yes. And, and, uh, 
since the era of the of the progressive ascendancy, this has not stopped being an express argument that democracy basically is is inefficient, that it doesn't work, and that the best thing to do is is to outsource, to do that outsourcing that Percy's talking about. Let me give an example that may seem a little bit out of left field, but that I think is really telling. And and that is, you know, this Respect for Marriage Act that just passed. Irrespective of the side that one may be on about gay marriage itself, it suddenly occurred to me that this whole thing now where everybody wants to codify certain Supreme Court decisions, and it all happened after Dobbs because it turned out that you could actually overturn a Supreme Court decision, right? <laughs> Shocking, <laughs> right? I mean, it is, it's, it's funny, but it's like, you know, my colleague and, uh, and boss, Charles Kessler, who edits the, the Claremont Review of Books, made this point that the, the problem with Dobbs was not just how sacrosanct abortion was in the leftist project. It was also that uh, court constructed substantive due process rights are the whole architecture of the progressive universe. And if one of those planks can be just taken out, then any one of them is vulnerable. That's why Clarence Thomas's uh, concurrence was so scary, even though he was the only person to say, now we need to revisit all these other decisions. He said the quiet part exactly, out loud. Exactly. But it's true. I mean, like if you, if substantive due process is a fiction, which I think it is, then you do, you know, you are going to, all of these things are vulnerable and they're vulnerable even more fundamentally because the courts aren't supposed to be making these sorts of decisions, you know, which is maybe another way of saying the same thing. Anyway, this funny thing then happened where Democrats were like, well, what we really need to do now is write laws in Congress that codify these decisions uh, and these principles, and then they'll be safe. To which I thought, you know, I, I have news for you about Congress. Like <laughs> we vote <laughs> in new people, like, and, yes. and they also can write new laws and can overturn things. And it's like, everybody wants a final answer to these culture war issues. Yeah. That is like one side definitely won. And that's that. But a lot of these issues, that's not our form of government. Like we debate these things together face to face and we come up with compromises uh, that we yeah. enact locally. And people are you know, they would rather have, uh, in many cases, I think, the definitive pronunciation of the experts. Well, and it's, and I, I think there's something tempting, but ultimately flawed about this. Just, and not just about politics, but but even more broadly speaking, mm. I, I stop myself all the time. This is another way that scientism creeps into your head. Uh, I try not to talk about human things as problems that can avail be be availed by solutions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because almost nothing in human life that isn't a medical condition uh, is is actually a problem in that way of I can find a technical answer that will fix this. When like, I mean, yes, you can set an alarm to get yourself out of bed. To use your example earlier, you could set five alarms. You you could do the Jocko thing and just like stagger them on top of one another. Right. But you still have to make the conscious choice of will to get up and go lift heavy things if that's that's how you're ordering your day and how how you have aspired to order your day. Yeah, you could wake and, up and turn off the five alarms just as easily as right. turn them on. You know, that's yeah. right. And yet, all the time, we use the, the this problem solution pairing. As if, and the, to get back to the political thing, as if we're not tomorrow going to find another challenge that our hypothetical final solution to this great problem has caused. That so, so the the things we do to ameliorate the challenges that are in front of us tend to create a new set of challenges, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and and this is human life. It. It is an unending series of this sort of thesis antithesis cycle. And just as you, you know, and, and you talk about the Polybius uh, regime cycle in the book for a little bit. And there, there's a very similar version of this sort of dynamic. Yeah. yeah I so mean, the other, and I'm so glad you mentioned medical problems because it, I, the, the danger, the thing that I am trying to train myself out of now is, is medicalizing. Uh, regular phenomena, yeah. right? And, and that's in terms exactly. of the language of psychology, psychiatry, or the language of of actual, you know, physical ailment. You do this all the time, right? Like, oh, I had trauma. I had you know, this is uh, I suffer from, um, or I struggle with, or suffer from 
uh, depression, suicidality. And so, I mean, these are not diseases. They are uh, spiritual struggles. <laughs> and we should talk about them Correct. that way. You know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so maybe, maybe this is a good way to draw us toward the ending I had in mind, which is I wanted to end by talking about love, which is to the degree there's a solution, yeah. I put in air quotes, <laughs> present in your book. You talk about love. You talk about the ordering principle. And I just want you to talk a little bit now about how love points us back to the real. How does it help us out of the fixes that we perpetually find ourselves in? Yeah. You know, it's interesting that just kind of naturally we've been edging up upon this very this very thing as we start to talk about, you know, it's going to be a daily grind. You're going to wake up and you're going to have to make the decision, right? To uh, get up in time to make breakfast for your kids, to go to church, to, you know, to, to read for 30 minutes a day, whatever, you're, you're going to have to make these decisions afresh each time. And, and, and that's because uh, love is love of the particular. And uh, by the end of the book, I, I even say even something as noble as save the West is, is a kind of unhelpful aspiration if it's not embodied in in the here and now, in 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 the fullness of the here and now, not just this kind of reductive, like you know what what's the physical reality around you, but the whole experience that you wake up every day and 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 are immersed in. And yeah, this is this is my answer. This is my solution. How do you save the West? Love, but you have to write a whole book about it because you have to earn your way to it, right? You have to earn your way to yeah. an understanding of love that isn't just going to boil down into nice fuzzy feelings, and you know. What begins sly, somewhat slyly, perhaps, at the very beginning of, of the book, I drop in this Iris Murdoch quote. She's one of the great pl- disciples of, of Plato, you know, in the in the 20th century. And, and she says, uh, love and, and so art and morality is the extremely difficult realization that something other than oneself is real. It's a great, it's a quote. beautiful, beautiful <laughs> line. And that's really, you know, when you come down to politics, people are, are, are feel immobilized by the fact that there, there are all these sort of structural crises going on at the level of our national government and indeed, you know, mm-hmm. the world. And uh, those narratives, those crises are in some sense designed to immobilize you. Um, you are not going to muscle the cycle of regimes back into place, right? Like, <laughs> not, <laughs> Absolutely no. not. <laughs> and it may be that you are, have some role to play in, in uh, ameliorating those big problems, but you will find them in the particulars of your human-sized life um, because that is where you are capable um, of doing love as a verb, right? That this is where if some if a man says he loves right. God but loves not his brother, he is a liar. Why is that? Well, because we're very easily uh, swayed into making God into the kind of amorphous jelly of our particular preferred abstractions. God is love. God is goodness. God, all these things that God actually is, right? But there's a reason he took on flesh, right? There's a reason that uh, yes. that Christmas happened. There's a reason the cross happens, and that's because it, it, we are actually more complete, uh, more noble, more elevated at the size that we're at. The, the man, man is made right in the image of God. And exactly that, like, this is where, uh, goodness and, and joy take place on our earth, in our creation. They take place in the daily political and personal struggles that people wake up and choose to do, uh, out of love of the good and embodiment of the, of the good and the realization that something, someone other than oneself is real. Well, and that I think particularly as we're recording right before Christmas. Uh, but Our audience won't hear this till after, but I think it's a good place to stop. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for this hour and talking about all these great things. Spencer's book uh, will be out at the time we put this podcast up and it can be bought anywhere you buy books. So please go out, get yourself a copy of How to Save the West by Spencer Clavin. I'm Brian Smith, and this has been another episode of Liberty Law Talk. Thank you for listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk. Be sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please visit our journal at lawliberty.org.